Hello students, welcome back to the course on organizational behavior, individual dynamics in organization. Today we move to the third lecture of module 9 where we look into learning in organization and specifically today we'll deal with some of the very core fundamental theories involved in learning. So in previous uh, few classes we have looked into learning, we have understood what learning is specifically, we have also uh, had a bit of uh, understanding with respect to what learning happens in an organization and how learning is relevant in an organization. If you remember in the previous class I also mentioned in fact uh, underlined the fact that learning has to lead a person to behavioral change. If that's not happening, that's not learning. I'm Dr. Abraham Salaisak. I'm a faculty here at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So straight away moving into today's session, the consequence of organizational behavior can change the environmental situation and can greatly affect subsequent employee behaviors. So this is the theme of today's lecture where we look into the relevance of learning in changing the organization behavior, the behavior of individuals within organization and how it acts as a precursor for the further change that is about to happen. So let's look into the learning theory background. It has been not been so popular in organizational behavior. Let's be very honest with uh, the different theories. Uh, learning has a certain level of significance or it has a better footing when it comes to psychology. But when it comes to OB, the, the aspects like let's say motivation or let's say personality, those theories are more uh, considered or discussed or deliberated. I would not say that the, these are not important, but the deliberations are have happened mostly when it comes to OB in terms of personality, in terms of motivation, etc. When compared to uh, learning, uh, these are the certain aspects or certain uh, disciplines which have gained prominence. And I'm not saying that learning theories are irrelevant, but in fact, learning theories are more relevant when it comes to OBM. And we'll discuss that today. Perfected theory of learning would have to be able to explain all aspects of learning. They have universal application and can predict and control learning situations. So an understanding, specific understanding of certain theories, specifically the core learning theories is vital to the study of OB in general and behavioral performance and uh, specifically interpersonal performance, interpersonal relationship and the performance of individuals in, in management or in organization in particular. So let's look into the, the fundamental theory, the behavioristic theories. The most traditional and research theory of learning comes out of the behavioristic school of thought. When I'm looking into behavioristic theory or behavioristic school of thought, the basic understanding should be the quiz or the cues or the, uh, the signals are coming from outside. There is nothing that is intrinsic. It is more reactive. It is more uh, uh, dependent on the outside world. So the environment is guiding or triggering the behavioral pattern. So with that understanding, it will be more, more clear that you can understand or grasp or get a grip over the behavioristic approach or behavioristic school of thought. When you look into the classic behavioristic specifically, such as the Russian pioneer, Ivan Pavlo, you must have already, uh, some of you at least would have heard about the Pavlovian experiments, etc. And the American John Watson attributed learning to the association of connection between stimulus and response. Again, please understand that environmental cues or uh, the determinants of behavior essentially lies outside the organism or outside the individual. That's the basic, that's a fundamental principle of behavioristic school of thought. So the operant behaviorist, mainly in particular well-known American psychologist Skinner, would uh, give more attention to actually uh, to the role of that consequence that happens in terms of the behavior play in learning or the response stimulus situation. So operant conditioning is more of an RS type of arrangement, response stimulus, whereas uh, classical conditioning more of stimulus response arrangement. We'll discuss this in detail in the coming slide specifically. But uh, the, the, the basic understanding with which we move 
to the further uh, topic is that environmental cues guide the behavior. I will react to a certain behavior, certain certain environmental cues outside. It could be a behavior also of some other individual. I react to that. That is a fundamental school of thought of behavioristic approach or behavioristic school of thought. So let's look into classical conditioning very uh, specifically with respect to Pavlov. Pavlov's experiment is uh, all about giving, uh, you know, conditioning to a particular dog. So there is an unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response and starting from that it, it comes all the way to a conditioned stimulus and conditioned response. So Pavlov's classical conditioning experiment uses dogs as a subject and it's one of the most important study that has happened in behavioral science. There is no doubt about it. There cannot be any study or any quote or any reference in classical conditioning which goes without Pavlov's reference. So classical conditioning can be defined as a process in which a formerly neutral stimulus, I would like to underscore the word neutral, when paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So we have first the former neutral stimulus, second the unconditioned stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, this is the third part that elicits a conditioned response. So my attempt here is if you are not aware of the Pavlovian experiment, I am more interested to make you understand the, the theoretical understanding as well as the practical uh, takeaways from this particular experiment. So we are looking at a stimulus response arrangement. So here the stimulus is the bell and saliva happens to be the response. So basically this experiment is all about a dog was given food and it, it is natural that when, when you give food to the dog, it has a particular saliva or it salivates. So uh, saliva is a natural outcome or it's a natural observation when we give food for any dog, right? And in those perspective or with respect to that perspective, Pavlov had a different arrangement altogether. He tried to condition the, uh, the behavior of the dog or change the behavior of the dog with respect to a stimulus. And this is what we are trying to see in this particular experiment. So uh, uh, there was a bell that was uh, rung or a uh, sound of the bell was made so that the dog gets an idea that the bell was later when it was coupled with the food. It salivates. So basically the first part was that the, the food was given, naturally the, the dog uh, salivates or the dog produces saliva, there is no doubt about it. We can observe that in any dogs, that's the, the basic instinct of the dog. But the second part was the sound of bell was made and the third part was the bell was coupled with the food. So it happens that he experimented in such a way that when you sound the bell, then the food is given. So there is a conditioning that's happening in the mind of the dog that after the bell, the food is going to come. So the fourth point or the fourth quarter is more significant where even when the bell sound is heard, the dog starts salivating. Now this is critical. This is what Pavlov tried to establish that condition stimulus can give you a conditioned response. If you look into the particular stimulus at the first phase, the food was an unconditioned stimulus, whereas the dog had an unconditioned response of salivating. Now, when you look into the neutral stimulus, which is the bell, was given as a neutral stimulus, the dog essentially did not respond to that because to the sound of a bell, the dog need not respond and dog will not respond unless and until it's some other alarm or the dog is being tried or made to respond in some other way. But for a natural setting, for a natural uh, ring of a bell, the, the dog need not salivate or dog need not even respond to that. When it was coupled, I mean the neutral stimulus bell was coupled with the food it produces an unconditioned response. So again, please understand that the food uh, plus bell happens to be a combination of neutral stimulus plus 
unconditioned stimulus. So, in fact, there was an unconditioned response which was the saliva. But after conditioning, what happened is that the bell in itself, which was the conditioned stimulus, generates saliva in the dog, which is a conditioned response. So, if you look into the entire conditioning experiment, Pavlov's dog experiment, despite the fact that, you know, uh, the, the neutral stimulus warrants uh, 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 no response, we have seen that conditioned stimulus can be given to get conditioned response as in this particular case. So, despite the theoretical possibility of, uh, let us say, the, the widespread applicability of classical conditioning and its continued refinement and application, because it's, it, it, it does not stop here. Conditioning experiment, though Pavlov have done it, a lot of theorists who have tried to improve on that. But even after those attempts, most contemporary learning theories, theorists technically agree that it represents only a very small part of total human learning and behavior because we there are strict critics who talk against the conditioning process there are people who talk against uh, the behavioristic school of thought there are people who talk against the approach of conditioning altogether so there are critical criticisms that come against classical conditioning but that said we cannot ignore the relevance of the Pavlov's dog experiment in terms of the conditioning and in terms of behavior that is being produced within the organization. If you look into uh, specifically uh, the classical conditioning, Skinner, uh, when it came to the RS approach, in particular felt that the classical conditioning explains only reflexive behaviors or respondence behavior because you see that there is, there is a condition stimulus of the bell ringing and there is a condition response of saliva that is happening. So, Skinner felt that more complex, uh, that common human behaviors cannot be explained by classical conditioning alone. So, what happens with respect to uh, the entire classical conditioning is that, uh, let us understand this from a different perspective. You are being trained to do something in a certain manner with certain stimuli. Now, this is to an extent true, but it can also have a, a certain bit of criticism involved in that because when you look into some behaviors which are very complex in nature, like in, in an organization, let us say, it is like your subordinate or your, let us say your boss wants to train you or condition you uh, to some, some particular job. That is, let us say, uh, it could be as simple as you know, you are part of a meeting and uh, he wants to be, uh, make you, let us say, the secretary of the meeting or let us say, condition you to take the uh, minutes of the meeting, something like that, where, where, which you are not supposed to do in the first place. But when it comes to the actual uh, undertaking of that entire behavior, it is not simple as it thinks because there are other considerations other social considerations, other, uh, you know, physiological considerations, other practical considerations which the employee will do that, okay, at this point, if I start taking minutes, I will be acting effectively as a secretary to the particular head. Now, that should not be, it is not as simple as it, it looks like. So, this is what Skinner specifically tells that classical conditioning is good, no doubt about it. But that said, it cannot explain complex behaviors in itself. There are practical problems associated with the entire classical conditioning issue, in a classical conditioning test. So, Skinner, through his extensive research, posited that behavior was a function of consequences, not the classical conditioning eliciting stimuli. So, we are looking into uh, now more of a set of consequences that happen rather than just conditioning eliciting stimuli and here comes the relevance or the critical operant conditioning because Skinner was very critical about the classical conditioning. Operant conditioning is a type of learning in behavioral psychology that focuses on how behavior is influenced by its consequences. Now, when we look into classical conditioning, it was, as I already mentioned, it was more of a stimulus response approach. But when we look into operant conditioning spe specifically, it is more of 
an RS approach, primarily by, with learning that occurs as a consequence of behavior. That is a response stimuli approach. It's a, it's a reverse of what we had actually discussed before. So operant conditioning has much greater impact on human learning than classical conditioning because that is more practical when it comes to OBM, organizational behavior management, operant conditioning also typically explains at least in a very simple sense much of organizational behavior. Why you actually do a certain or undertake a certain behavior in an organization, classical conditioning might not be able to explain that because many a time your behavior is not conditioned by anybody. Your behavior is not uh, actually influenced by anybody. Rather, it would be a consequence of some other, some other behavior some other response and that is an RS arrangement which Skinner details on. It might be that employees, let's say they are working for 8 hours a day, 5, uh, five days a week in order to satisfy their needs. Let's say needs like uh, we, we detail that in, in the module of motivation, uh, physiological needs, you know, recognition, safety, security needs. So all different types of needs for different individuals at different point in time. So to satisfy that, to have a satisfaction guaranteed with respect to those needs, to get those needs actually fulfilled, you are actually performing. So it's, it's part of a consequence, it's part of a response and that will generate another stimuli. So this is what Skinner was very particular about in operant conditioning. So let's sum up the differences between classical and operant conditioning. In classical conditioning, a change in stimulus Let's look into unconditioned stimulus to conditioned stimulus will elicit a particular response. In operant conditioning, on the other hand, one particular response out of many possible uh, ones occur in a given stimulus situation. So this is the classical difference that is there between classical conditioning and operant conditioning. The stimulus situation serves as a cue in operant conditioning. Whereas if you look into the, the case of uh, you know, classical conditioning, the stimulus situation was eliciting the response, but that is not the, uh, the, not the fact or not the, the critical point in when it comes to operant conditioning. During the classical conditioning process, the unconditioned stimulus serving as a reward is presented every time. In operant conditioning, on the other hand, the reward is presented only if the organism gives the correct response. Now, this is what actually differentiates classical conditioning from operant conditioning. The reward happens or the reward is presented only if the organism gives the correct response and this is vital to actually understand operant conditioning in detail. So, I hope that I was able to clarify. See, most of you might have already a clear understanding of this Pavlovian experiment and how Skinner was a critic to that and how operant conditioning came into picture. But that said, we have to understand and appreciate when you also feel that there are certain behavior, certain behavioral tendencies in organization, when you are part of an organization which is triggered by outside elements. We call it stimuli. With, we call it the environmental cues, but definitely it is triggered by the outside elements. So that is the contribution of conditioning specifically, be it classical or operant, to the, to the realm of theories associated with learning. Now let's look into cognitive theories. We have, we have looked into conditioning, we have looked into different types of conditioning. When we come to cognitive theories specifically, Cognitive theories can also be used to understand learning as an input into social and social cognitive theories. So you are looking into a social element here. We are bringing the human interface into picture to better understand behavior and performance management. So we, did, we are not stopping at behavior because when we ideally talk about conditioning, be it classical or operant, our thought process hovers mainly around behavior. But when we are coming into cognitive theory, we are taking it a step further by understanding or relating it with behavioral or performance management specifically. So Edward Tolman is widely recognized as a pioneering cognitive theorist. He felt that the cognitive learning consists of a relationship between cognitive environmental cues 
and expectation. So expectation is the fundamental aspect when it comes to cognitive theory. Rather than just a mere stimulus guiding the behavior or triggering the behavior or a consequence triggering the behavior, it is more of the environmental cues as well as the expectation of achieving something, expectation of getting something, expectation of conquering something that is leading a person or an individual towards a certain behavior. He felt that cognitive learning consists of a relationship between cognitive environmental cues and expectation. So he developed and tested this theory through, through a lot of collaborated experiments. We look into the Tallman's theory in detail. He was one of the first to extensively use uh, what is now famous the white rat. If you look into most of the experimentation, we use white rat uh, in plenty nowadays, but, the, but he was the pioneer in doing that in basically in psychological experiments. So he found that a rat could learn to run through an intricate maze, which was his experimental setup with purpose and direction towards a goal. For rat, the goal is food, undoubtedly. Now, Tallman observed that at each choice point in the maze, expectations were established. So you have a maze in picture and within that maze at each point, there is an expectation that is established maybe with respect to the food that at this turning or at one point the food is being would be available so that expectation is created within the rat the rat learned to expect that certain cognitive cues associated with the choice point might eventually lead to food so if the rat actually received the food the association between the cue and the expectancy was strengthened and learning occurred at one point, let's say the rat is moving in a different maze setup and at one point the rat is finding food. The rat is expecting and it is finding food, the learning is happening. So next time possibility is more for the rat to exactly trace the route. And similarly, we can extrapolate this to a particular understanding of human behavior that when there is a cue and the expectancy happens, and the actual reward happens, the learning is strengthened or the learning occurs and the behavior is strengthened. In contrast to the stimulus response or the response stimuli uh, learning in the classical and the operant conditioning approaches respectively, Tallman's approach could be depicted as more of a stimulus-stimulus type of understanding because we are not talking about a specific uh, reward at the point the learning association be happens between uh, when the, uh, there is association between the cue and the expectancy. That there is a cue that the food will be provided at the point and also the expectancy is created in the rat that the food will be available at that point. So that will initiate or that will trigger the behavior of the rat or that will aid the rat to actually perform in, in, in a similar way. So this is where cognitive theories are very critical when it comes to the learning. In another early classical study to demonstrate cognitive learning, Kohler, Wolfgang Kohler used chimpanzees presented with the problem of obtaining an out of reach suspended banana. So what happened is that at first the chimps attempted to jump for it because it, it, it was naturally out of reach for them. But they learned that, that that is not possible. They gave up and rather they seized a box that had been placed in another part of the room that was deliberate, dragged it under the object, mounted on it and took down the fruit. Now Kohler called this more complex learning behavior as insight. In a moment, you are seeing that there is a goal which is out of reach, which is out of reach for you. You are actually trying to take something which can aid and equip you to reach that particular goal. This was the first time that this was displayed as an experiment. So that's the reason why Wolfgang Kohler categorically named it as insight. Now, industrial training programs starting after World War II and in many respects, even still today, even in industry, drew heavily on Tallman's SS connection and Kohler's insightful learning ideas.
So we have to be thankful to these two people when we look into cognitive theory specifically. One is Tolman's SS connection whereby he is actually trying to uh, bring in the relevance of expectation and how the cues can match expectation and behavior can be made and Kohler's insightful learning ideas which is nothing but more of the, the understanding that there is something that is out of reach but you are bringing on something that will equip you or that will enable you to reach your target. So we have looked specifically into some of the theories, we will also again delve deeper into some other theories but these happen to be the fundamental blocks of learning theories. When we look into different disciplines, be it psychology, be it social psychology, all those streams or all those disciplines of knowledge will have a lot of consideration into these particular theories. But as I have already mentioned, OBM unfortunately does not give that much of weightage to uh, learning theories rather it takes more of motivation theories into its account or maybe more of personality theories into its account. That said, if you want to actually judge a person's behavior, if you want to actually understand your behavior in an organization, how you actually move from one zone to another, one level to another, you hierarchically may be moving one step to another, but there are situations where people who who are who sometimes make a big jump from one position to another within the organization, it's because of learning. That learning happens in some or the other way and to explain those learning either the conditioning or the cognitive theories comes to your aid. So that should be the takeaway from today's lecture. We have seen classical conditioning, we have seen operant conditioning, we have also looked into other aspects of theories including cognitive theories. But that said, one thing should be certain in your mind that the stimulus especially when you are looking into the behavioristic school of thought, your behavior is guided by external elements or triggered by external elements or external cues outside you. So in the organization you feel that sometimes you are, you are uh, frustrated, you are angry, it is because of somebody else, it could be. Your behavior should be triggered. We also look into a different perspective altogether where, why this should not be the case, this should not be only the case. But at this point, learning theories of conditioning as well as cognitive theories help you to understand in judging your behavior as well as your co-workers behavior. Thank you for listening to me patiently. We'll see you with more theories in the next class. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.